Thank you, Catherine. Okay, so we're back for some more of the magic. Um, so we had a couple of questions, but first we wanted to say again, for these interviews, they're gonna be short, about 10 minutes. And um, we had a lot of conversation on Twitter, which we'll tell you about. And uh, anything that we don't get to that needs to continue being discussed, we'll bring it into the panel tonight. So don't forget to leave any questions or comments in that box outside. Okay, our first question came from Anne from New Hampshire. Uh, and her question was, do wild or free range dogs that are domesticated but are in a different context, do they bark as much as those living in our houses? Really happy she asked that question because we chose to talk about it. So um, it, uh, Ray actually briefly mentioned it, but there have been studies looking at barking in free range dogs. They don't bark as much. One of the reasons is they don't have that um, well, at least according to the hypothesis, what fits well is that they don't have that constraint anymore. So when we see them bark is when they get backed in a corner, when they end up in a house, when they, you know, when they're, they're somehow constrained to move. They still bark, especially when you, when you get too close and they can't run away, but it's not to the level that you see it in our pet dogs, mm -hmm. much less likely. And whereabouts have those sort of studies been conducted? So um, the one that I'm thinking of is by uh, Ortolani, and it was done in Ethiopia. Yep. Um, we had a question from Finland. Um, one of our people who's been participating in the online uh, discussion all day, um, been really, really active on Twitter, um, wanted to know, can both of these hypotheses have, or I guess can both hypotheses be right um, or valid because there's always a receiver? Well, there's certainly, I mean, they're both valid hypotheses, which is why we tested them. If one was completely ridiculous, we wouldn't have bothered. Um, so um, the problem is that they are somewhat mutually exclusive. So one requires, again, that they're context specific. So one requires that these things are always occurring the same way, and the other requires that they are not. So, and one requires that they are specifically selected, and one requires requires that they are not. Mm -hmm. So they are somewhat mutually exclusive. And I just do want to make one clarification that a lot of people in response to that 2009 paper immediately um, threw the hypothesis out because they felt that they could understand their dogs. And it's still possible that you can glean information from that sound. It's just not adapted for that. So for example, you may recognize that bark that your dog learned to get the food off the counter. Um, and just as you may recognize the sound your cat makes when he's about to throw up a hairball, right? There's specific sounds and we have big brains and we can recognize that, but it doesn't mean that it's adapted to send us that information. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of leading off of that, uh, Mindy from Maryland was saying, uh, do dogs then only bark when conflicted. So that learning things blows that out of the water, right? So you originally they're barking in the conflict context, but then suddenly you've added extra meaning to it, like, <laughs> like uh, you get to go out the door when you make this bark, or you get to you get food when you make this bark, or I throw the frisbee when you make this bark, or whatever it is that they've learned. So they can then associate that previously non it had no meaning attached to it, they can then associate it with a meaning, just like you can train them to sit when you say sit. Mm -hmm. But we often do the barking thing by accident. <laughs> We've got a quick one that will probably, well, I don't know, it may be quick, um, but a question that came from Brazil, asking, can play barks have a low fundamental frequency like aggressive barks? Absolutely, so um, play, Play itself is often conflicting, so so a lot of times um, it's a situation where, where where the animal's not really sure what's going to happen next. It's not always clear if you're still playing. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. There may be previous experience with play being um, bad. You know, they interacted with the dog and it didn't go well, or they interacted with an owner and they got stepped on, or something like that. So they could certainly be like, oh, "Okay, this is getting a little intense," and they could have a lower, noisier play bark. In fact, some of those dogs mm -hmm. did. In fact, all those lines going the wrong way were dogs that had deeper, noisier play barks than stranger barks. So they could have not just thought that strangers were better, but they also could have thought that, str that playing was a little scary. Mm -hmm. okay. I just wanted to ask something a little bit different, which is what do you think was the most interesting part of this study for your students um, in the study of dog vocalizations? Or you know, what do you think they really took away from this line of research? Well, I, I hope, I can't speak for them, although <laughs> I hope they took away um, you know, methodology and things like that. But also uh, just sort of the scientific inquiry. How does it work? How do we come up? I mean, they 
really did a lot with this. We started from day one, I gave them the questions, they helped develop it, they performed it, they helped write it up, they did the statistics with me, they did everything. So I hope they got an idea of what that process is like. And some of them were really disappointed with the findings, you know, some of them really, really wanted it to be caught, you know, they're like, come on guys, you can be context specific, and it wasn't. And so I think that was kind of interesting for them to see that there was some, there was some information here that wasn't necessarily what they expected. So uh, the topic of barking is obviously a loaded area for many dog owners where barking can be problematic, especially if you live in a big city or you live in a place where you could be fined if your dog is making noises at bad hours of the day, you could say. Um, so do you think it would be beneficial if owners more specifically attended to the ways in which dogs are barking? And at the same time, um, does it interfere with this desire that we have to sometimes decrease their barking. Yeah, so um, I certainly hope that, I, mean, I think all of us doing scientific research hope that this information can be helpful in um, applied situations. So I hope that trainers can take this information and hopefully use it for things like decreasing nuisance barking. If you understand the function of something or where it's coming from, it's a lot easier to, to increase or decrease it. Um, so I think that can certainly help. As far as trying to get your dog, sometimes people trying to get their dog to stop bark is act are actually increasing the conflict and do the exact opposite. So I think that kind of plays into that. So. Um, a lot of times people are actually teaching them to bark more. They'll bark and they'll sound really upset to the human. Something I didn't mention is we understand Morton's rules perfectly well. We are mammals and you can tell this by the fact that if you go up to a baby or a puppy, you do not go, hello little baby, right? That would be <laughs> horrifying. <laughs> And they would be really scared. And we know this. We don't even have to, it's not conscious. We just do this. We immediately go, oh, I don't know, it's a puppy. You know, we immediately do that. That's Morton's <laughs> rules right there. Um, and so we can glean information from barks that way too. We hear this deep, noisy pitch, and we get, we get, oh, something's a problem. Just like music, like Simon was talking before, you know, Jaws is deep and noisy. And then there's a happy little, you know, squirrel. So it's, it's there. We have this. So we can get that information. But sometimes that makes us react the wrong way. Oh, my dog's really upset. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And now we suddenly worded that behavior in that situation. And I was like, oh, I make a sound. And you come and you pat me. This is great. So things like that, I think we sometimes backfire on the information we think we're getting. I'd love to introduce you to my three-year-old and see her reaction. <laughs> Um, I guess just to close, before we, we go to break again, um, what do you still want to study in the area of dog vocalization? So in vocalization, I, I mean, you could go on forever, really. Um, there's, it would be kind of fun to look at, something I didn't talk about was we recorded the dog's responses vocally to these barks. And the funny thing was, the very first dog we recorded, it was so exciting because he barked in response and we're like, yes, we got good clean barks in response, we can, we can do that. We thought that was where really where most of our information was gonna come from, from the barks that the dogs produced in response. And he was the last dog to bark at anything. And everybody was so shocked, they bring their dog in, oh, my dog's gonna bark, my dog, nothing. And so the, interesting thing about that is that usually, like I said, the response, the more detailed response is based on the information they get once they attend. So there was no further information. It was three barks and then nothing. No, no auditory, no, no nothing. So it would be interesting to see if we did a longer bark clip where they continued to get that something's conflicting, something's conflicting, just like a dog in a kennel that can't see what's happening. Oh God, I can't see what's happening. This is really scary. Oh, what's happening? And I think we would have maybe gotten more barks. So that would be kind of fun to see what they would have done in that case. Well, very good stuff, and um, thank you so much. And for everybody, we're going to take a half hour break, and uh, if you have it, like I said, 15 minute break, and <laughs> please, um, please leave your questions and comments in the box outside, and we'll see you real soon. Thanks.